Good evening and welcome to each and every one of you. It's good to see you again. I missed you the last couple of evenings. We're going to go on one of my favorite journeys tonight. If you lean back and fasten your seat belts and relax, we shall be on our way to the Waldensian Valleys and the Church of the Martyrs. We leave from the city of Torino and catch the side rail that takes us about 40 miles due west. For your interest sake, by the way, Torino is the Detroit city of Italy. I mean, the Alfa Romeo and um, well, nearly every automobile that you can imagine that's made in Italy is made in the city of Torino. So it's highly industrialized. It's only a very short distance, however, over to where it's really quite remote. And we're headed to that remoteness tonight. <clears throat> in the Piedmont Valleys, there is a village called Torre Pelici, And that is our first stop. Torre Pelici was the center of a revival of the study of righteousness by faith long, long before Luther and Calvin and other of the reformers. The revivalist was a man by the name of Peter Waldo. That's the way we would say it. And he's unrelated entirely to that little guy that you find in the, the kids' books. You know, it's about that big. Valdo is the way they say it out here. Peter Valdo had been a church leader, and he found and loved the stories of the righteousness of Jesus, salvation by grace, and he began to share that. And soon a movement was born, and the followers of this teaching and this wonderful truth would become known ere long as Waldensians. Some say that the name Waldensian is related to the name of the spiritual leader, Peter Valdo. Others say no, it is related to the name of the fertile valley, the Vaudois, or this part of the country. That matters not to us tonight in our study. Peter Valdo began to teach and share, and his congregation grew and flourished and grew further still, and then the persecutions fell. Now, if you go to the encyclopedia or to the Internet to study about the Waldensians, there is a likelihood that you will find under the same heading um, certain other Christians in the area of Europe, sort of under a subtitle. But when I talk about the Waldensians tonight, I'm talking particularly about the people from these valleys. We got off the train at about 11 o'clock. One night, we'd made no prior reservation. This was the last train of the day, and it would spend the night here in the little town of Torre Pelici and then return to Torino in the morning. And so we went over to the nearby hotel. We could not find anyone in the office. <clears throat> we knocked on some doors and couldn't raise anyone. By now, it was midnight, and we were exhausted. And so we went inside the parlor and closed the parlor doors behind us and then just sort of took charge. We removed the cushions from the couches and put some of those on the floor and some of us slept on the cushions and some of us slept on the springs, but we four preachers and one other man spent the night inside the lobby early next morning. We opened the doors and there behind the desk was the... Was the the office clerk, the concierge, and, and his face dropped like this. Who are you and where did you come from? And, and we told him what we'd done. And he said, well, it's just as well because you have arrived here on the anniversary of the Waldensian church. And I've forgotten how many hundreds of anniversaries, but he said the Waldensian leadership have come back from all, all over the world and every bed and breakfast, every pension, every hotel room is filled and so it's just as well that you spent the night had i known you were there he said however i surely would have brought you pillows and blankets and he said be our guests then and go across the street and have breakfast with the waldensian christian people we did that and some of the stories that i'm going to share with you tonight i learned while i fellowshiped and ate with the waldensian people who had come back for this worldwide congress 
We asked eventually, does anyone know where we could find a local who knows the area and might know someone who has a, a limousine that will hold five or six adults? We want to go to two places. We want to go, firstly, to the hidden school of the uncles, and secondly, we want to go to the Church of Martyrs. Someone suggested that we go to a local pastor who'd spent a lifetime there. We did that, met himself and his wife. There they are. We asked them, do you know of someone that might have a limousine? And he made a phone call, and there long there came a man. And we told him of our desire of destination. He said, get in. You know it's going to be a long day. Yes, we knew that. In fact, we knew that if we made both appointments, the Hidden School of the Uncles and the Church of the Martyrs, it would require at least two days. So he began to drive us from the village of Torre Pelici, climbing higher and higher and higher still. En route, I noticed several things that I want to share with you. I want you to notice over on the extreme right-hand side of the screen, there they have terraced the land. They have picked up the native stones and made fences and elevations out of them and encouraged grasses to grow on those elevations, grasses with which they'll feed a cow or a few goats during the winter time. I want you to notice the ruggedness of the land. Here we have a canyon that goes off kind of to the right, and, and then here's one that does the opposite. And both of those are running beautiful, clear, pure mountain water. Here we see a haystack or two. And I noticed that uh, many of the folks making hay were of the feminine gender. Here's the evidence. Here are these two ladies that have just put down their scythes and their hay rakes, and they're having lunch out of their wicker basket. <sighs> I've thought about this, ladies. They cut the hay, they swing the scythes, they stack it in the little haystacks with pitchforks, where you see they have had equal opportunity employment here for a long while. Now you're not so sure whether you like that or not, huh? Okay. Notice the one lady, though. Let me just point out with my pointer here. Here's this lady has her shoe exposed, the sole of her shoe, and it has those hobs on it so she can gain traction on the steep and off a damp hillsides. Keeps her from slipping in the grasses. Well, we've literally now come to the end of the road. We have told our driver, whom we have hired, from here we're going to be hiking to the hidden school of the uncles. Please wait for us. It's going to take hours and hours, and we will pay you whatever is fair. And so we got out and began to make our way on foot. Colored building that you see was once a hotel at Rhodes End, Rhodes End Inn, but today it is inhabited by a local native family. It had poured rain the night before. I mean, it had just been a downspout. And when we got around to the front, here were the two little native boys right in the middle of the biggest mud puddle they could find. Proof that little boys are the same, whether they're in Italy or the United States or Africa, wherever else. Little boys are going to get right in the middle of the mud. Ere long, their father came, and we asked him, the gentleman on your left, how from here shall we find the hidden school of the uncles? And he began to give us directions. Now, I want to give you a bit of background regarding the uncles. The church leaders had for centuries been referred to as father. The pastors were called the fathers. But as they continued to study the Gospels and the New Testament teachings, they discovered that in the Bible, that spiritually speaking, we have only one father, and that is our Father which art in heaven. And so the pastors asked the laity, please no longer refer to us as father. And the church folks asked, what then shall we call you? And the pastor said, well, we're all a part of the family of God. You may refer to us as the uncles if you choose. And so from that point on, the pastors became known fondly this, with this avuncular term, the uncles. The pastors would take the young people way up into the mountaintops, and there they would put them to work making copies of the New Testament, handwritten copies. For during these dark ages, 
Bibles were literally chained to monastery desks. They were for the interpretation only of the pastors and the priesthood. And the Bible headed a list called the index. And if you were found with the Bible or any portion thereof, you could and very likely would pay with your very life. And so these young folks would go way up into the tops of the mountains to the college of uncles, simply a little rock shelter made of native stone with native vines trained to go around it and to hide it. And there they would hand copy the Bible. When they had one of the Gospels perhaps finished, they would open the linings of their clothing and put that copy inside, go back down into the major cities of Europe and repair pots and pans or sell yard goods. And when they found a family they felt was honest, they would open up the linings and at the risk of their lives, they would share the Bibles. Now we're going to begin to make our climb then to the hidden school of the uncles. And as we begin our journey on foot, I want to give you a bit more of the background of the Waldensian people and their struggles and their persecutions. On one occasion, the leadership of the church sent out a letter to every university president, and it read like this, destroy the Waldensian students, destroy them totally and completely. And presidents of universities wrote back and asked, how are we to know who is who and what is what? I mean, to the large degree, they speak the same language and, and they look the same, their skin color is the same. How are we to differentiate? And the answer came back, if they are your finest students, if they always make the dean's list, if they are neat and clean in their persons and in their language, and if they never cheat on tests, then destroy them. They're surely Waldensian. Some credential, huh? And so on many occasions, the church armies were directed to go and hunt down the Waldensian people and destroy them. And not unlike the jungle drums, word would precede the army's approach and the Waldensian Christian people would climb higher and higher and higher up into the mountains. If they were pushed to the extreme, if the armies were relentless, then at the peak of the last mountain, the summit of the tallest peak, they would cross and then they would be in France and there they would find religious and political asylum they would find safely. But after several unsuccessful attempts to destroy them and they're slipping over into France, the directive came from the headquarter, we're going to push them over the summit and this to the king of France and his armies, you be waiting on the other side and we'll have them trapped in a pincer movement. And uh, that happened and the Waldensian Christians died en masse on that one single occasion. The persecutions against the Waldensian Christians lasted for many, 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 many generations. Well, we're climbing now. We have been told by the man from whom we've gotten directions that when we came to the fork with the main path, take the main path, and he said eventually, if you stay on it, you'll come to the church of the open. And so we're staying on that path. As we do so, we go by several of these stone buildings in which they store hay and grain and other commodities, animals on occasion. They told us that in the wintertime, the snowfall may be as deep as 10 or 12 feet, that all on the ground at one time. And furthermore, these buildings are made out of the native stone, picked off the field so the grass can grow. And they've been standing for hundreds of years and there's not one drop of mortar between the stones. That's good construction, isn't it? Pretty good builder that does all of that. Well, we climb higher and we come to where a local family is living. It's a very typical home here in the Torre Pelici countryside. Chickens are scratching around the front yard and here's the hay mow made out of the same native stone. We're going to go around behind and notice the shingles upon the roof. There they are, made of native stone as well, a slate, a thin slab of stone. Those things are about uh, 24 to 30 inches wide and 18 to 20 inches deep. I thought to myself, I'm glad I'm not in the roofing business here. 
You wouldn't want to be a shingler here. But uh, the good news is once you get them on, you don't have to replace them every 15 or 20 years. They're there to stay. We climbed higher and looked back, and the buildings took on sort of a reptilian look, as you can easily see there. And then we turned around, and there it was, the church of the open that we had been instructed regarding. Our Lord Jesus said, a light set upon a hill cannot be hidden. And so when these people could come out and worship in the open, they wanted to be in the most prominent place. We're going to see how very prominent it is and why. And so we're again going to walk around to the left and come up on a level with the church and look across at it, and we see that it sits right out on the face of a cliff. There it is, a drop of about 170 feet. We were greeted inside by a lady whose summer job it was to greet the tourists and instruct the tourists. And as soon as we spoke to her a sentence or two, she said, You're from the U.S., aren't you? Yes, we said. We're from the, the Pacific Northwest. Oh, she said, I had a dear friend, my best friend, it was from California. And she would come every summer and help me here to keep the place up and greet the tourists. But she said, tragically, last summer, my friend fell off the cliff to her death. And you can see how that could happen. We'll slip inside, and we see that it's crude, just hand-carved benches. The stovepipe goes all the way from the front to the very back, kept inside all of the heat possible. I thought this, I'll bet on worship morning you didn't have to beg the folks to move up front because that's where the stove was, you see. Well, we asked this lady who greeted us here, how from here can we find the hidden school of the uncles? And she said, go out behind the church and take the main path, and then it will divide into three branches. And you ma Oh, she said, I'm going to get you lost. We'll never find you again. I will take you. So she closed down the church and became our guide. We stepped outside, and here was a lady doing her laundry, the big cliff is behind her. There's a fence there now, thankfully. I want you to notice a couple of things. Firstly, her scrub board there, it's one of those stones just like they put up on the roof. And secondly, notice that she's wearing rubber gloves. Now, that's not to keep her hands pretty, but it's rather so that she can stand the ice-cold water in which she's doing her laundry, for it's from the snow melt just up above the mountain. Our next stop We'll be at the Waldensian laundromat. Just briefly, we'll pause. And there, my friend's <laughs> doing his handkerchief at the Waldensian laundromat. Well, we began to climb, climb higher and higher, stop for a rest and climb some more. The lady who met us at the church is our guide. I'd wanted the picture of our group coming up the mountain. And so from the rear, I ran around the others. I passed them ran up the trail a few yards, turned around, knelt on one knee, focused and shot this picture and was focusing for another when I heard her speak to my buddy right behind her in French. He spoke very fluent French, and I had the feeling that it involved me. And so I asked my friend, what did the lady say? And he said, she told me to tell you, watch out for the snakes. <laughs> this is the last picture you're going to see of my group coming up the mountain. I brought up the rear from that point on. And you'll notice this lady, by the way, is wearing high-top rubber boots for that very purpose of safety. Well, we would sit down and look across the canyon, and we would see little white dots. They're about center pictures, one right there. And then you look up, way up and over to the left, and there is one in a meadow. And there's another up to the extreme right. Those are the homes of the native folks. This is far, far beyond the end of the road, and they have no helicopters. They get here by hiking. We walked on to the hidden school of the uncles before we recognized that it was there, made out of the native stone with the native vines to grow over it. The sign says, Collegio de Barba, the College of the Uncles. We we'll go inside, and in the very center, we see a huge stone, and in the center of the stone is a preserved copy of one of the original old Bibles, upon, from which, rather, they made their copies. Here is another view where they've taken it out of the case for us. You can imagine the young people gathered around that big rock and laboriously copying from the Bible, the Gospel of Matthew, 
the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Mark. These people loved their Lord Jesus and they loved His Word. And you can never, never separate the Word of God from the Spirit of God or from Jesus, can you? They always go together, don't they? I remember so very well as I reflected upon all of this before I left, asking myself this question, Lyle, how much do you love Jesus? I mean, lip service is easy. Anyone can say it. Yes, I love you, Jesus. But these folks lived their lives for Jesus and were willing to die for Jesus. We hiked back down. It was now dark by the time we arrived at the car. We made an appointment for the gentleman to take us the next day over to the Church of the Martyrs. We've come again to the end of the road, and here is a big stone monument in the parking lot. And once again, we must hike a good ways. The sign that greets us here says, Yeza de la Tana, the Church of the Cave. Now the pathway becomes steep and rocky and precipitous. There are places where we go around the faces of cliffs where the pathway is no more than 30 inches wide and the drop off more than 100 feet. Yes, perhaps in places nearly 200 feet. And it was at this point that many stepped off to the side and decided they wouldn't go further. I tried to imagine what it was like, perhaps during the winter time, when these Waldensian Christian people would go together to worship, even during the most difficult persecutions, during the most heinous of times, the most dangerous circumstances, these people knew the value, if not necessity, of coming to worship together. And in Hebrews chapter 10, 25 and 26, we find a warning there regarding the last days. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of summons, and much more as you see the end coming. And so these folks would go to church in the wintertime and in the summer and the spring and during the rains. And I wondered how careful they must have been when there was ice on the trail and they go along this narrow pathway. They're going to a cave, the church of the cave, the Church of Martyrs. One family member might leave well before dark and head off in that direction and make a circle back around to the cave. And several minutes later, another family member might leave and start off in that direction and then make a circle to the cave. But ere long, the families would gather together. They would go back inside and there they would sing and pray and fellowship and have lunch, spend most of the whole day encouraging one another. In front of the cave there, another stone sign, Gieza de la Tana, the ancient temple of the revived faith, where the spirit of the fathers preached, suffered, and died for liberty of conscience. They were back inside on one worship morning when they were discovered. We don't know if someone was followed or if someone gave information told on someone. We don't know. What we do know is that there were over 260 men, women, children, babes in arms back inside when the leadership of the church shouted inside, come out with your hands up. And the people knew that if they did that, they would die, instantly die, or perhaps after some torture, they would be killed. And so they stayed inside and prayed. And the command was given again a short time later, come out, this is your last chance. And they stayed inside. And then the officer said, bring burning material, you soldiers. Bring dry wood and bring green leaves and grasses as well. They did that, gave one last chance. And when the folks refused to come out, the torch was put to the burning material and as it began to burn brightly, the smoke was sucked back inside and every single person died. Hence the name, the Church of the Martyrs. I'm going to tell you tonight that many of those who died, many of those Waldensians who loved Jesus to the death were destroyed because they would not observing the Saturday Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath. We're going to talk about that tonight and about its place in the Bible and about what's happening in the world tonight. And I want you folks again to ask yourselves the question that I asked a bit ago and you ask from inside the cave, how much do I love Jesus? Thank you for traveling with me.
Now to our subject this evening, rest in Jesus, the meaning and the purpose of the seventh-day Sabbath. Folks are fighting stress, and I want to read you a little something that I found written by a medical doctor. Will you listen very carefully? The lives of some men are so tense that they're soon going to become past tense. Tension is as deadly as a loaded pistol, only it takes just a bit longer to kill its victim. Then he goes on to talk about the problems that are associated with this hypertension and, and the stress and all of this. And he concludes by saying that what we need to do is to return to an age-old plan, to a plan God gave his children, our parents, in the Garden of Eden, and that is a much-needed day of rest. And he's talking about the Sabbath. He goes on to talk about something that was of interest to me. He said that the nation of France several years ago decided they would go off the seven-day cycle, work six days and a day off, six days and a day off. They would go off that cycle and revert to a 10-day cycle, work 10 days on and then two days off, 10 on and two off. And they experimented with, with it for about two years and discovered that there were far more problems, that the people were more stressful, that there was more illness, there were higher doctor bills. And so they went back to the plan that God set up in the Bible to work for six days and then have a day off. Here is God's solution for stress. And so I want to talk with you for the next few moments about God's Saturday Sabbath day. We're going to go back to Eden, you and I together. So open your Bibles, if you will, please, to Genesis chapter 2. The book of Genesis is, of course, the first book in the Bible. And in that word, Genesis, we find the word genes. And from that same word, we have genetics. And I'm going to begin to read at verse 1. Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 and 3. And if you have a Bible, please follow along with me. And if you don't, shame on you. Look on with your neighbor, all right? Genesis chapter 2 and the first three verses. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all of the hosts of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he'd made, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he'd made. And God blessed that seventh day and sanctified it because in it he'd rested from all of the work which he had created and he had made. I know that it's no bit of new information, you folks, when I say to you that Jesus Christ is not only our Redeemer, he is also our Creator. And I'm going to give you several verses because several folks that I visit with and talk with have never heard this idea before. I want you to put in your notes John chapter 1 and verse 1. We'll not have time to turn to every scripture tonight because the clock won't allow it. But in John chapter 1, verses 1 and then verse 10 and 13, it makes abundantly clear that our Lord Jesus is not only Redeemer and Savior, but He is also Creator. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. That's Jesus. And then you come to Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, and there again it's made abundantly clear. Colossians 1, 16, Jesus is our creator. You read from Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, the same thing. Jesus, our Savior, is also our creator. The question then comes, was Jesus the active agent at creation, when we talk about keeping the Sabbath and, and making a, a holy day, and the answer, of course, is yes. It was Jesus who on the first day said, let there be light, and there was light. And on the second day, something else, third day, something else. And on the sixth day, he made the largest forms of animal life, and our parents, Adam and Eve. And then our Lord Jesus, Savior, Redeemer, and Creator, rested on the seventh day of the week. Was he tired? Was he worn out? Was he stressed? No, God doesn't get tired, and God does not become stressful. But rather, he did that to give to you and me and all of us an example. And the Bible is abundantly clear that our Lord Jesus is our example in every area of Christian endeavor. Uh, there was some doubt about how folks ought to live before Jesus came. And so the Bible says, when the fullness of time was come, God sent his Son and Jesus taught us how to live in this area and what to do in this area and, and about baptism, this and this and the Lord's Supper. And when it came to rest and worship, our Redeemer, Creator, our friend Jesus Christ kept 
the Saturday Sabbath. He kept it in creation. He kept it when he was here as our example. He kept it as well in redemption. I've heard a lot of folks say, well, that Saturday business was just for Jews. That was the old Jew day. Now look, folks, if we reject something because of its connection with Jews, we're going to have to throw away our Bibles entirely, aren't we now? Because without exception, this is a book authored entirely and completely by Jews. And if we're going to turn away from something because of its connection with Jews, we're going to have to turn away from God's new earth and His heaven. The Bible says, Revelation is uh, replete with information, that in that city, that beautiful holy city to which we one day plan to go, there are four gates on each side, and above each of those gates there is a name of one of the tribes of Israel, of Judaism. That's exactly right. There are no Gentile gates. I don't know how in the world we're ever going to get into God's kingdom unless we're willing to go through a Jew gate. And so if we're going to reject something because of its connection with Jews, we're not only going to reject the Bible, we're going to turn away from the new Jerusalem. And beyond that, if we reject it because of a connection with Jews, then we're going to have to at the same time reject Jesus because through his earthly parentage, he was a Jew. The Revelation chapter 5 verse 5 says, He is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Exactly so. Our Lord Himself said in John 14 and verse 6, I am the way and the, help me now, the truth and the life. There it is again. He gave us example in every area of Christian endeavor. I am the way and I am the truth and I am the, I am the life. The disciple Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21 said, Jesus, speaking of Jesus, he said, He is our example that we need to walk and follow in his footsteps. And now we're going to transition a little bit, and I'm going to share some of you folks that I have not really been acquainted with for a terribly long time, and I'm still discovering more in this area, and the more I discover, the more wonderful I feel, and the more excited I become. Our Lord Jesus is not only our Redeemer, our Savior, our Creator, He is also the lawgiver from Sinai. Did you know that? Yeah, I'm going to make it abundantly clear to you now. The background, of course, is Moses and Aaron have led the children of Israel out of Egypt. And because of their hard hearts, they've had to wander round and round and round on the Sinai Peninsula. And then they come to camp at the foot of Mount Sinai. And in thundering tones, there comes a voice from the mountaintop saying, I am the Lord thy God which has taken thee by the hand to bring thee out of Egypt. Therefore, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any idols or images, the likeness of anything in heaven above the earth, beneath the water, under the earth. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days to labor, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Now, I'm going to give you some verses that I want you to go home and look up and study and contemplate. First of them is Genesis 49, verse 10. Genesis chapter 49, verse 10. There it says, Shiloh. Would you note that word in your notes, please? Shiloh is the lawgiver. And Shiloh, throughout all of the Old Testament, is one of the names of the Messiah. Shiloh is the lawgiver. Now we're going to transition to the New Testament. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, the Apostle Paul, speaking of the Exodus experience, said, And all did drink of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Jesus Christ. And that's why, my dears, we sing lustily on worship morning. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, and rock of ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Christ was that rock. Here's one for you from David. David was a scholar as well as a hymnist and a poem writer. In Psalm 60, verse 7, he says, Judah, my lawgiver. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Judah is my lawgiver, said David. He's not only our Savior, he is as well our creator, and he is the lawgiver. 
Psalm 108, verse 8, here's another one that's along this very same line. Psalm 108, verse 8, where it says again, Judah is the lawgiver. In James chapter 4, verse 12, coming to the New Testament once again, as we put all of this together, James chapter 4, verse 12, it says, the lawgiver is our Savior. How more clear could it be than that, huh? The lawgiver is our Savior. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, introducing our Lord Jesus to us, it says, he shall save his people from their sins. Our creator, our redeemer, the lawgiver, our savior. The lawgiver then gave to us those 10 happy rules for living that we find in Exodus chapter 20. With that for background, we're ready to turn there and take up the reading at verse 8. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 8. And by the way, let me give you just a little bit of wordplay on that word exodus because I think some of you are going to find it interesting at least. The word ex, you know, means something from the past. Yeah, uh, an ex relationship maybe, uh, an ex whatever else, job, ex, something from the past. Hadas means the road, road in the Hebrew language, ex Hadas, the road out, the old road. You see, the leaving of Egypt to go to the promised land, ex hadas. Now, we've talked about the commandments that our Lord Jesus spoke from the top of Mount Sinai, the first three of them, and now we're going to begin to amplify the fourth. Let's take up the reading at verse 8, Exodus chapter 20. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you may work, and do all of it, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not work, thou, nor thy son or daughter, manservant or maidservant, nor the cattle or the stranger that's within thy gates. For in six days God made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. And then he rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord then blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now there are two phrases from those verses that I want to underscore in our minds tonight. One refers to sanctification, the other says hallowed. They mean exactly the same thing. They mean setting aside for holy use, sanctifying, making holy. Now, folks, I could work from now on the rest of my life. I could never make anything holy. Holy God, righteous God is the only one who can make something holy. And it's abundantly clear here that this day, this one day out of seven, he made holy. He made it in the beginning. He kept it when he was here as our example. He made it to be very special. The Saturday Sabbath, the fourth commandment, is right in the heart of the ten, isn't it? If you're going to do away with one, you can't just easily drop off one at the first or one at the end, but rather you have to go right into the center, right into the heart of the Ten Commandment law, and that's really where it belongs because it is a big part of the heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ as well. The Sabbath is in the very center, in the middle of the law, a day of rest and worship, a day to leave our stresses behind, a day to build relationships between ourselves and our God, relationships that are vertical, and at the same time, during the same 24 hours, to build relationships that are horizontal, relationships between a man and his wife, between a uh, husband and wife and their kids, strong relationships between families and friends. And that is the reason for the sanctifying of this day. Anything, therefore, then that we do that enables us to further strengthen the relationship between ourselves and our Creator Jesus and ourselves and our kids and our wives and our families, I believe, is proper Sabbath observance. And that's what it's all about. Get better acquainted with our families, get better acquainted with our Creator, with our Lord Jesus. Not so very long ago and not so very far away, I was sharing in a home some ideas regarding the Sabbath, and the man of the house said, well, look, that Saturday business is just only for Jews. That was just for Jews. And I said to him, sir, I have a question for you. Do you believe that only Jews ought not to tell lies? God said, that, thou shalt not bear false witness. That's one of the Ten Commandments. Is that only for Jews? Well, no. 
One of God's Ten Commandments says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Is that only just for Jews? No. One of the commandments says, Thou shalt not commit murder. Is that just for Jews? Well, of course not. You go through the whole of the ten, and you discover there is only one of the ten that many folks want to do away with and say it's only just for Jews, and that is commandment number four that says the Lord's Day is Saturday, and that that is the day. It begins at sundown on Friday night and ends at sundown on Saturday night that we need to come together to worship and that we need to spend time thinking about Him and relating to Him in this vertical relationship and relating to one another in the horizontal relationship as well. I want us now, if you will with me together, go to Matthew chapter 5. We'll allude to a lot of verses for one of time, but others we must of necessity read. And Matthew chapter 5 is one of them. Here we find our Lord Jesus speaking from the Sermon on the Mount. You remember the context is that He with His disciples are up north on the shores of Galilee, and the word gets out that He is there, that He has something special to share, and the people begin to come, and the press is so great that eventually Jesus has to get into a little boat and push off out into the waterways, and then He begins to give to them what we now refer to as the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5 verses 17 and 18. I want to read right now. Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. These are the words of Jesus from the mount. He says, Don't think that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I haven't come to destroy them, but rather to fulfill them. For I say unto you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the dotting of an eye or the crossing of a T shall be changed until all is over. Our Lord Jesus, Creator, Redeemer, lawgiver, Savior, said, don't think that I have come to change the law. Don't suggest for a minute that, that when I came to amplify grace and mercy that the commandments were done away or any part of them. No, he said, I have come to live them to the full and to help you to understand their broader meaning. He said, not the slightest dotting of an I or the crossing of a T in the Ten Commandment law is to be changed until the whole of the universe is finished. Therefore then, my dears, as long as we stand upon God's green earth with His blue sky overhead, all ten of His commandments, including the fourth, is for all of His children and for all time. In Mark chapter 2, verse 27, there our Lord is referred to as Lord of the Sabbath. Lord of the Sabbath. Mark chapter 2, verses 27 and 28. I remember... A lady said to me one time, well, because we live in New Testament times, seems to me we ought to keep the Lord's Day according to the New Testament. I said, ma'am, I couldn't agree with you more. But which day is the Lord's Day in the New Testament? Well, she said, I've always been taught that it was Sunday. So let me ask you a couple of questions, ma'am. What is your Christian background? Catholic or Protestant? Oh, she said, I'm Protestant. Well, I said that's been my background as well. Uh, then we will agree on this. We take the Bible and the Bible only as our rule of faith and practice as Protestants. Don't. Oh, yes, she said, of course. The Bible and the Bible only. Nothing else. Nothing more, nothing less. Yeah. Now I said, let's look in our Bibles for the Lord's Day. The Lord's Day in the New Testament. Do you have any idea where it's mentioned? Well, she said, if I heard, I guess I've forgotten. Well, I said, let's go back to Revelation chapter 1. And we did that. And there at verse 10, John describes the day that this vision that becomes our book of Revelation comes to him. And he says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a great voice like that of a trumpet. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. Now, that's the only place in all of the Bible that Lord's Day is mentioned. And it doesn't tell us which day of the week it was, does it really? All we can know from that passage is this for certain, that there some 40 plus years after the ascension of our Lord Jesus, he still had a special day, and John was given this vision, that's our book of Revelation, on that special day. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. But it didn't say which day of the week it was. Now, whom could we better ask which day is your day, Jesus, in the New Testament? Which is the Lord's day in the New Testament according to your word? And now, 
I want you, if you will, please, to go with me to Mark chapter 2, verses 27 and 28. We alluded to it a little bit ago, and we must of necessity read them just now. Mark chapter 2, verses 27 and 28. Mark 2, 27. Jesus said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore then, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath day. Which day is your day according to the New Testament, Jesus? Jesus said, I am Lord of the Sabbath day. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll make this statement now, and then we'll give lots of further information regarding it in a moment. You can search the Bible from Genesis to Revelation or do it in reverse, and you'll find that the word Sabbath day is always, without exception, in reference to the day that we call Saturday. Well, I've heard folks say, look, I, I just keep every day holy. I had that idea once. When I was first looking seriously at Christianity, I said, I'll just keep every day holy. And the Holy Spirit reminded me, I had a wife and two kids. I was going to have to work some days. <laughs> I was going to have to do some work. All right, I said, I'll have a holy weekend. I'll keep Saturday and Sunday both holy. And the Holy Spirit gently pointed out to me that wasn't going to work either. For the only day that I could keep holy was a day that God had made holy. On Wednesday, I discovered I could be ever so pious and read my Bible all day long and... and um, play my guitar with the hymns of the church, but I couldn't keep Wednesday holy because it was never sanctified, never set apart for holy use. The only day ever set apart was Saturday. You know, this thought came to me a while back. I noticed, by the way, as I came into your city that there had been some, uh, some big-name entertainers here this summer, huh? The Beach Boys and, and um, Joe Cocker. Now, I know who the kids are when I met. I know who the young adults are when I mention Joe Cocker and the, the old gray-headed folks. And by the way, I've really grown to love old people lately. <laughs> lately. Lately, yeah, that's right, dear. I've really grown to love old people. Well, in any event, if there was a great concert going to happen at, uh, at the George Gorge, I mean, one of the all-stars of all time is going to come and play there beginning 6 o'clock next Wednesday evening. And I say, well, it doesn't matter. I, what day, this day or that doesn't matter. I'm going to go on Tuesday at 6, huh? Would it matter? Yeah, I'd, I'd miss the performance, wouldn't I? Nothing happening there. I'd have to go at the time, at the time of appointment and the time for keeping the Sabbath is the day that we call Saturday. Sundown Friday, the sundown on Saturday. Is it important, huh? That's one of the Ten Commandments. Another one said, Thou shalt not commit adultery. If I were to bring up onto this stage seven women, and among the seven is my dear Peggy, would it make any difference which one I took home, huh? Oh, you ladies say, yeah. <laughs> yes, indeed, it makes a difference. Well... Folk have said to me, that whole Saturday business is legalistic. It just seems so legalistic. That over Sunday or something else or Friday. I, if I say that it's legalistic, really I'm saying that to have a wonderful relationship with my Jesus is legalistic. Isn't that what I'm saying? That's what I'm saying. The Saturday Sabbath is mentioned 60 times in the New Testament. It's mentioned more than any other single commandment, and there's not the slightest hint that it was ever changed. Not the slightest hint. Now, the Sabbath teaching is so clear, ladies and gentlemen, that if there was to be a change brought by the Apostle Paul or Peter or, or someone else, the change, the, the information regarding the change ought to be as clear as the original teaching, shouldn't it really now? But there's not the slightest hint let alone a change being made clear. I was watching a televangelist not so very long ago, and, and he was really coming down on, on this whole abortion issue. And I'm not here to preach politics tonight, but I too believe that life is sacred. And this televangelist was making a case that, that this business of abortion is, is the break, it's taking of human life, it's killing it's killing, it's breaking one of God's Ten Commandments. 
someone who had listened to him and watched him regularly came to some of my meetings and wrote him a letter and asked him, what about commandment number four that says the Lord's day is Saturday? And the televangelist wrote back and gave some real flimsy verses. And he said, well, that was all nailed to the cross when Jesus came. Huh? And that's how he been. This is legalistic. Abortion, that's one of the Ten Commandments. No, that's not legalistic. That's God's law. But let's be consistent. What do you say? Let's be consistent in our love for Jesus and in our obedience to Jesus. We must do it. It is a memorial of his creative power. Our Lord Jesus established the Sabbath so that there would not be any atheism, so that there would never be any communism or racism, so that there would never be a, a, this theory of evolution. By the way, this thought has come to my mind with, with beauty of late. You know, Charles Darwin is one of my indoor sports. And I can tell you this much from my Idaho background, he was wrong. I'm smart enough to know that he was wrong. Charles Darwin lived between 1809 to 1882. And he was an English naturalist and the father of the theory of evolution. And he taught, you know, that we are the result of an accident in a primeval pool. And then there came the snake that crawled around and then the monkey that swung and, and then finally man. And in 1863, now I want you to see the connection here. He died in 1882, and about 1863, he was writing his evolutionistic theories. And at that same time, 1863, God raised up a movement to combat the theory of evolution and call people from the Catholic Church and the Baptist Church and the Pentecostal churches and the Episcopalian churches and the Methodist churches and the Presbyterian churches to teach the Saturday Sabbath The Seventh-day Adventist Church was born. In 1863. And tonight, it's going like wildfire. The fastest growing Protestant church in this world is the Seventh-day Adventist. Am I bragging? You bet. When a year ago, our boy died. His widow, my daughter-in-law, along with Peggy and me, decided a memorial to his memory ought to be used to spread the gospel. And so out of her bit of insurance, our daughter-in-law, really our daughter, Brenda, sent to India $12,000 to build a church that would seat between 350 and 500 people. And they promised her they would send back pictures, and they did. And I just got copies of them myself. And there's a plaque beside the door of entry that says, dedicated to the honor of God our Creator and in the memory of Terry Albrecht. And then they told her that that church is open seven days a week and they cannot accommodate the crowds. And so many folks are wanting to become a part of the Seventh-day Adventist family out there that they can hardly build churches fast enough. And in the same town, they're building a school from kindergarten through the highest level of the university. And that's just a little bit of what's happening out in India and behind the former Soviet bloc and all the rest. It's going like fire and dry brush. The Sabbath is not just a principle. If it were a principle, I could choose one day out of seven, but it is a day, a day, the seventh day of the week. I have come to believe, ladies and gentlemen, that the most difficult attitude for God to deal with is indifference. 
I meet a lot of folks these days, an increasing number with open minds. They're searching as they look at the events of the world, and they have open minds. And when a truth becomes clear to them, they embrace it and accept it. And then there is a second group, and these folks are, are more set in their ways. Uh, I was that way. Yeah. The old Missourian attitude, you'll have to prove it to me. Show me exactly, dear, that's right. Show me. But these folks, once they are shown, accept. But in the middle of these two extremes, there is a large segment that says, so what? So what? This day, that day, any day, it makes no difference to me. I'm completely indifferent to the whole thing. That's not a new attitude. When Jesus came to Calvary, they hanged him on a tree, drove great nails through his hands and feet and made a Calvary, crowned him with a crown of thorns. Red were his wounds and deep, for those were crude and cruel days and human flesh was cheap. But when Jesus came to our town, they simply passed him by. They wouldn't hurt a hair of him. They only let him die. If a minute had grown more tender, they wouldn't give him pain. They only just walked down the street and left him in the rain. And still he prayed, forgive them. They don't know what they do. And still it rained those winter rains that drenched him through and through. The crowds have now gone and left the streets without a soul to see. And Jesus crouched against the wall and cried for Calvary. Let's pray. Lord, your word is clear. You're our creator. You're our redeemer. You're our savior. You're our lawgiver. You spoke the Ten Commandments from the mountaintop. You kept them, and when you were here as our example, we're going to keep the Saturday Sabbath with you in heaven. Thank you for the many folks around the world who are now turning their hearts to all of your truths, recognizing that it is important to keep all of your commandments. We're going to do it in heaven. We're practicing here. I pray tonight that you'll not let any home or heart represented here be indifferent continue to plead with our children, our spouses who aren't ready. But the please, Lord, don't put off your coming. We need you so. So hasten back, Jesus, dear. We beg you in your name. Amen.